So we're talking about moving forward in faith even when we don't understand parts of God's word. I think it is a safe statement to say that every believer will have times where you read something in scripture and it just doesn't make sense. And it's in that moment when you're wondering, like, how do I process this? How do I work through this? I'm supposed to be a person of faith. We recognize scripture says the just will walk by faith. And you kind of expect some of those moments to come along the way if you're dealing with prophecy or maybe some Old Testament law or maybe a, a big theological term. But it doesn't kind of make our hearts settle in easy whenever you're wrestling with a key truth, a foundational belief that has immediate impact into your daily life. So in our study of the Gospel of John, we are finishing up Jesus' discourse on the bread of life. And he has already addressed a number of extremely confusing, difficult topics, such as the will of God, election, predestination, human responsibility, and future resurrection. So then he gives the granddaddy of all confusing topics. He talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. It was a statement that was so difficult that it says in John chapter 6, verse 60, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? Last week, I shared that this particular exchange is vitally important for every single believer. Theologically, it's extremely important because he was talking about how believing in him is the only way we experience eternal life. And it is the overflow of eternal life that the entire Christian life is lived. Everything flows out of relationships. So we need to understand that theologically. But practically speaking, he's also helping us walk forward in faith even when we don't understand every part of what he's saying. And that's something that you and I are going to have to do for the rest of our lives. If you're a follower of Christ, there's going to be promises in God's word that when you read it, it doesn't seem to line up with what you're currently living right now. It doesn't line up with your experience. And you're going to be in that challenging moment of, will I trust God or will I trust what I think or what I sense or how I feel in this particular moment? So last week, I gave two big truths to help any time you find yourself in one of those difficult places in Scripture. Truth number one is God's word is true even when my understanding is limited. And truth number two, my understanding is strengthened even when my faith is weak. And what I shared last week is you take the little bit of faith you have, you place it in the God you know, and you trust that in time he can clarify what is currently confusing. This morning, I want us to continue with those same two big truths, and I want us to finish out Jesus' discourse on the bread of life. So I'm going to invite you, join me in the Gospel of John, chapter number 6. John, chapter 6, I'll begin in verse number 51. I'm sharing the second half of a message I began this last week entitled, The Word of God. I am not going to read this entire section in advance. In fact, it's a very long text, but I am going to continually refer to it, and I'm going to try to call out the verses so that you can see where it is on the screen, or at the same time, so that you can go through and see where it is in your own scripture. Now, remember, this entire section is talking about how Jesus is the bread of life, and only those who savingly believe in him have eternal life. That is his focus for 50 verses. And to help us understand that, he's talked about the work of God as it relates to Jesus being the bread of life. Then he talked about the will of God as it relates to Jesus being the bread of life. And right now we are in the word of God as it relates to Jesus being the bread of life. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, prepare our hearts and our minds for what we're about to get into. Heavenly Father, you say in your word that your spirit will guide us into all truth, and we need that desperately this morning. This particular text is one that has been confusing to so many. God, give us clarity this morning because your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me take just a moment, and I want to reestablish the flow of the story so that everybody is caught up on what we covered this last week. In this final section of his discourse, Jesus is not sharing any new truth 
He's not sharing any new information. There's a few new details, but there's no new truths that are being presented. The only thing that is different is he is taking some of the same concepts he has shared in previous verses, and he's sharing it in a more symbolic fashion. So at this point, the crowd was upset with Jesus for two reasons. He continued to say that he came down out of heaven, and the second thing is he continued to claim God as his own father. And they recognized Jesus solely on a human level. He was a fellow Galilean. His, his dad was Joseph. They knew his father and his mother based on verse 42. So knowing that, how could he also claim that he came from heaven? And how could he also claim that God was his father? What he said did not line up with what they believed to be true. They started grumbling. Well, Jesus was not discouraged by their grumbling. In fact, he worked right around it. He told them, stop grumbling, and then he gave them a, another promise. He said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and all who come to him, he will raise up on the last day. Verse number 44, by rejecting his truth, they were rejecting his grace. And by rejecting his grace, they were rejecting his gift of eternal life, which is the entire focus of his discourse on the bread of life. Jesus is the bread of life, and only those who savingly believe in him have eternal life. To get their attention again, Jesus contrasts himself with the manna that their fathers ate back in the wilderness. While manna sustained their life for a period of time, it never granted them eternal life. Everyone who ate that manna still died, based on verse number 49. But Jesus is the true bread which came out of heaven, and anyone who eats that bread will never die. It is this idea of Jesus being the true bread out of heaven, people eating this bread and experiencing eternal life that is his entire focus and what sets us up for the next set of verses. So I'm going to go back and look again at verse number 51 because this is a key verse in order to get us moving in the right direction. So join me in that text. It says, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also, which I will give for the life of the world, is my flesh. Now, there are three truths, these are in your notes, that you can find directly from this one verse, just from verse 51. First truth is Jesus is the living bread which came down out of heaven. He makes it extremely clear here. Second Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. Very clear promise. And number three, the bread of heaven is the flesh of Jesus. Look at that in the verse itself. The bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, it is Jesus who is bringing up this idea of flesh, bread, in eating. He's the one bringing these words together. Notice how they responded in verse 52. Then the Jews began to argue with one another saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now just so that we're all on the same page, Jesus is not condoning cannibalism. He's not saying, I want you to eat my physical flesh. Remember, eating refers to trusting in or savingly believing in. Jesus is giving a physical illustration of a spiritual truth. It is the exact same thing that he was doing with all of the I am statements that are found in the Gospel of John. I've listed those for you so that you could see them in your notes and also have the reference. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I am the gate. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine. Now, Jesus is not claiming to be an actual loaf of bread. He is not claiming to be a physical light that is shining in your eyes. He is not claiming to be an iron gate that is swinging back and forth on its hinges. He's using metaphors in order to show people he alone is everything they need for the Father. He's the gate to the Father. He's the way to the Father. He's the truth to the Father. He is the, the light to the Father. He, he's everything we need in order to get to the Father. But the group completely missed 
the point. So they began to argue with each other. And their argument centered on this question. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now, notice the way Jesus responded in this moment. Instead of saying, guys, you completely missed what I was talking about. I'm not talking about my physical flesh. I'm talking about trusting in me. You missed what I'm trying to say. Instead of him going back and doing that, he doubles down on the same analogy. Look at what he says in verse 53. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and here's his new piece, and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. Now, if it was hard for them to take eating his flesh, it is harder for them to take drinking his blood. And here's why. The law of Moses expressly prohibited people from drinking blood or even eating meat that still had blood in it. If they were to do that, the penalty is to be cut off from the people of God. Leviticus 17, Genesis 9, and Deuteronomy chapter 12. So what he is saying is not aligning with the law of Moses. They're, they're questioning, like, how can this be true? It was hard for them to understand. So I can understand why they are apprehensive in this moment. But three times he says the exact same thing. Eating his flesh, drinking his blood is essential for eternal life. Now, the metaphor that he is using speaks of the necessity of accepting his impending sacrificial death on the cross. In fact, you will notice all throughout the rest of the New Testament that the term blood is a graphic metonym for Christ's death on the cross and his final sacrifice. Over and over again, it just simply speaks of his blood. His blood, his blood. It's a graphic way of describing this ultimate sacrifice. So, for Christians today, let me tell you where our mind immediately rushes to in order to remove the tension of what Jesus said. When he talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, our mind, after 2,000 years of church history, runs to communion. Because in communion, we say his body is the bread, his blood is the wine. It just seems to make sense. Ah, it's okay. He's, he's talking about communion. In fact, because we try to relieve that tension, there's some of the major theologies about communion that have come out of this exact verse. In fact, Catholics, Orthodox, Episcopalians, and Anglicans refer to this passage as proof of the doctrine of transubstantiation. That is your $5 word for this morning. Everybody, you just write that one off the side. It's spelled exactly as it sounds, transubstantiation. But it is a highly literal interpretation of this passage and of communion as a whole. It is the belief that the actual body and blood of Christ are literally present in the bread and the wine of the mass. According to this belief, the bread and the wine of communion are literally transformed into the flesh and the body of Jesus by an ordained priest, and thus it becomes a reenactment of the death of Christ. Now, the counter view to this came out of a Lutheran background. It was called consubstantiation. Within this particular view, it is that Jesus is with or he is in, or he is under the communion elements themselves. That view focuses on Jesus' words when he said, do this in remembrance of me, or when Paul made the statement, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That view sees communion from a testimonial or a memorial perspective. And then there is another view that came out by John Calvin. It's one that's held by many Reformed churches. And that is the idea that Jesus is spiritually present with his people in the communion service. Now, Calvin referred to this understanding as the doctrine of real presence. Here's what he was trying to capture. Every person who is a born-again believer who studies the Word of God can see places in which Scripture talks about the omnipresence of God. God is everywhere at the same time. But we also understand that there are specific points in Scripture that it seems like God is with us in a special way at certain moments. For example, we believe that God is with 
believers in a special way different than how he is in general in the rest of the world. Because he says he abides in us and we abide in him. That's different than how he relates with his presence in the rest of the world. Also, scripture speaks of the fact that God inhabits the praises of his people. There's something unique that happens when God's people are praising him, that there is a special presence of God that is within that moment. The same is true when it comes to communion. It's the idea that whenever we participate in communion, that there is a special presence of Christ that is there. There is a blessing that comes to believers as we remember his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Now, that's probably more information than you ever wanted to hear about communion on a Sunday morning. But here's why I gave it to you. This text, John chapter 6, is the, the text of which multiple views of communion have come out of. There, this text has been used to teach communion again and again and again. But here's what I want you to see. Jesus is not talking about communion. There's a lot of theology that has come out of a text that's not talking about communion. And I'm going to give you several reasons why. If you've got a place to be able to jot these down, just kind of jot them down. They're going to be pretty quick. But here's one of the reasons why we believe this is not talking about communion at all. First, communion had not been instituted at this point. The first communion doesn't take place until the upper room just before Jesus goes to the cross. The second reason is Jesus is addressing unbelievers in John chapter 6, and communion is only for believers. We find that all throughout the rest of the New Testament. A third reason is this reference to eating and drinking leads to salvation, while eating and drinking of communion is for those who are already saved. So you can see there's a difference in how this is worked out. There's a fourth reason, that is, according to this, communion would bring eternal life. Because it keeps saying, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have to do this to get eternal life. If that's the case, then according to what we find in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, salvation is by grace through faith alone. It's not by participating in communion. That would mean everybody who's ever received communion automatically has eternal life. That does not align with the rest of Scripture. A fifth thing is the word sarx. It's the Greek word for flesh. S-A-R-X is used in this text. Every time in the New Testament that's speaking of communion, it is the word soma. S-O-M-A. It's the word for body. Why would it be that there's this one text where it's using a completely different word? And this is probably one of the most convincing truths for me, and that is the words eating and drinking that are found in this text are in the aorist tense in Greek. The aorist tense speaks of a once-for-all completed action. Now listen, if that's talking about communion, communion is to be an ongoing, repetitive action. It's to be something that we continue to participate in communion as we remember what Christ has done for us. So the weight of evidence here is Jesus is not talking about communion here. If that's the case, what's he talking about? I got one word. Believing. Believing. That's the entire focus of the Gospel of John. These things I have written to you that you may believe in Jesus, and by believing you may have life in his name. The entire focus of his discourse on the bread of life is Jesus is the bread of life, and only those who savingly believe in him have eternal life. The word believe or believing is found eight times in this section. The focus is believe, 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 believe. And in this time, all he is doing is taking that same truth and he's sharing it in a more symbolic fashion. As I said at the very beginning, there are no new truths in this section. He's taking the same idea and he's stating it in a different way. Just as scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. It is speaking of Trust him, try him, believe him, and you will see he is good. 
He is trustworthy. He is righteous. He is holy. That's, that's what it's referring to. So in this, it's the same basic idea. Here's another thing to think about. The words eat and drink have a much deeper connection when it comes to believing. To eat or drink something requires personal appropriation of that thing. You have to receive it yourself. So consider it like this. It's possible to identify food and to admire food and to call every type of food by its French name and still never actually eat the food. If you don't eat the food, the food doesn't satisfy you. In the same way, it is possible to know truth about Christ, to admire the teachings of Christ, to be familiar with the stories of Christ, and never savingly believe in Christ. And if you don't appropriate Christ for yourself, if you don't eat the bread of life, he will never satisfy you. You will spend the rest of your life trying to be satisfied by something else. You'll spend the rest of your life wondering why all these Christians seem to get it. They're happier than me. They got joy. I just keep going. Church, I mean, I think that's what I'm supposed to do. I don't get it. I mean, he will not satisfy unless you personally appropriate him by faith in your life. It's this idea of personal appropriation. Savingly believing in him is what is connected to these amazing promises that he gives. To those who savingly believe in Jesus, there's three wonderful promises out of this text. These are in your notes. First one, with him you have eternal life. Without him you have no life in yourself. Based on 53 and 54. It's not that you have some life a spark of life, a glimmer of life. It's not that you got a little something. He's like, you have no life in yourself. The next truth, with him, you will be raised up on the last day. It is the promise of the resurrection, what God has done through Christ with the resurrection and what he promises to do for those who are followers of Christ that is absolutely essential in our belief as Christians. And number three, with him, you have abiding union with Christ. This idea of union with Christ is a prominent theme in John's gospel, but this is the first time it's mentioned. This is the initial place. He says also in John chapter 14, verse 20, in that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. It is this beautiful union that is mentioned. Also in chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus declared, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So he's giving an incredible promise to people that are willing to receive this gift of grace. If a person repents of their sin by placing faith in Jesus Christ, they receive eternal life. By rejecting his offer of grace is to reject his offer of eternal life. Now, somebody might say, but what if I don't believe what you're saying? What if I don't even understand what the text is meaning? Here's what I can tell you. If you don't understand, but you're interested, I want to encourage you. Continue to read the Gospels. Continue to read the New Testament. And as you do, pray this very simple prayer. God, if you're real, would you reveal yourself to me? You find over and over again, when people are willing to submit to God, read his word, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. You will find over and over, when God is drawing someone to himself, he uses his spirit and he uses his word to illuminate that person's mind, to understand truths that they could never comprehend apart from his grace. Also consider this. Is it that he's not clear or is it because you don't like what he's saying? There's multiple reasons why people reject Jesus' word. Sometimes they just don't understand. Sometimes they fully understand. They just don't like what they understood. 
No, notice this as we kind of close this section out. Jesus did not try to clarify their misconceptions because their problem was not intellectual. We, we know that because their objections were never a direct criticism of his teachings. They didn't say, here's three reasons why we reject what you're saying. One, two, three. They, they never said, this part of what you're saying, we cannot believe. The reason here is because his teachings were too consistent and too self-authenticating for that. They could not get around the clarity of his teachings. So instead, what did they do? They attacked him personally. He's a nobody from Galilee. He's the son of a carpenter. His dad was Joseph. We know his parents. You can't trust him. How does he say he came from heaven? How does he say God is his father? Listen, if you can't attack the argument, you attack the person. That's exactly what they kept doing. His, his argument was sound, but he didn't get off on the side of trying to defend himself. He just kept going back to his teachings, back to his teachings, back to his teachings. By showing himself as the bread of life, Jesus shows that he alone is able to satisfy the deepest needs of the human heart. I did not say he will satisfy every whim and desire of the human mind, but he will fulfill the deepest desires of the human heart. Part of the gospel story is that God created humanity to serve him and to know him. He was our focus and he was also our fulfillment. And when we rebelled against him, when sin enters the equation, we find that there is now a brokenness. There is a deep longing inside because we are not able to experience what we were created for, to serve him and to know him. We live in a spiritually hungry world that is desperate for something that satisfies. I want you to listen as Christian apologist William Lane Craig writes this, and I just want to read this to you because his words are amazingly profound. He says, and I quote, Who am I? Man asks. Why am I here? Where am I going? Since the Enlightenment, when he threw off the shackles of religion, man has tried to answer these questions without reference to God. But the answers that came back were not exhilarating, but dark and terrible. You are the accidental byproduct of nature, a result of matter plus time plus chance. There's no reason for your existence. All you face is death. Modern man thought that when he got rid of God, he had freed himself from all that repressed and stifled him. Instead, he discovered that in killing God, he had killed himself. For there is no God then man's life becomes absurd. Apart from God, mankind is a doomed race of, in a dying universe. Because the human race will eventually cease to exist, it makes no ultimate difference whether it ever existed. Mankind is thus no more significant than a swarm of mosquitoes or a barnyard of pigs. For their end is the same. The same blind cosmic process that coughed them up in the first place will eventually swallow them up again. End of quote. It is into that type of a fallen, depraved, desperate world that Jesus came. And he said, I am the bread of life. Only Christ fully satisfies. It is only Christ who can bring us back into right relationship with our creator, who can enable us to experience why we've been put on this planet to begin with. We were placed here. We were created to serve God and to know him. And whenever we are in right relationship, the Bible calls that eternal life. John 17, 3, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It's only through Jesus' 
that sinners obtain forgiveness. It is only through Jesus that rule breakers are restored to right relationship with God the Father. It is only through Jesus that the grave clothes of sin are removed and we are clothed now in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is his offer that he is giving. But in order to receive the offer, it means we savingly believe in him. Not just that we admire his teachings, not that we just attend church, but that we put our whole heart, we put our full trust in who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Jesus is the bread of life, and only those who savingly believe in him have eternal life. It's great that your spouse might be saved, but their placing faith in Jesus doesn't mean that you get a free pass. It's great that your grandparents were Christians. But because they were Christians doesn't mean that you immediately walk in through the pearly gates. It has to be that we personally appropriate by faith who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Do you know Jesus as Lord and Savior? I'm going to ask you if you would to bow with me for just a moment. Heads bowed, eyes closed. We have worked for months to get through Jesus' discourse on the bread of life. And every single bit of it leads back to eternal life, eternal life, eternal life. And eternal life is only made possible when we place faith in what Jesus has done for us. So this morning, you might be at a place where you've heard and you understand and you recognize exactly the promise that has been given to you. You might be at a place this morning where, where you know you have not placed faith in Jesus at that level. You've, you've been an admirer of his teachings, but you've never placed faith in him. This morning, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. I'm going to lead in a very simple prayer in just a moment. And I'm going to say from the beginning, praying this prayer is not a magic formula. It's not if you pray this prayer, you're saved. Jesus has done everything necessary for you to be saved and to be in right relationship with him. All we're doing in this prayer is leading people to recognize by faith what Christ is extending to them in grace. So if you're at a place in your life and you're saying, I want to know I have eternal life. I want to know that I've been forgiven of my sin. I'm going to lead in a very simple prayer, and this prayer would be between you and God. Simply go like this. God, I know that I am a sinner, and I know that my sin has separated me from you. I believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin, and that he rose again on the third day that I might have eternal life. As best I know how, God, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Please give me eternal life. With heads bowed, eyes closed, I'm not going to ask people to Come forward, but I would love to rejoice with you this morning. For just a moment, if you prayed with me, would you slip your hand up wherever you might be for just a moment? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You may put them down. For those of you that have placed faith in Jesus today, I've got a book I'd love to give you right after the service. I'll be standing out next to my table as you leave the building. I'd love to give that to you. Also, if you want more information, just write on the back of one of those connection cards that's in the seat back in front of you. Put your name, any information you'd like us to have, and just put there that today you've decided to follow Jesus. We want to connect with you on this. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the fact that your gift of eternal life still transforms lives to this very day. We ask, God, that you would continue to do your work in each of us. In Jesus' name, amen.